everybody. Great to have you along. Hockey Night Online. I am David Amber. We're into the final week of the regular season. Ten games on top tonight. The playoff picture is becoming much more crystallized today. Philadelphia as well as the Minnesota Wild can clinch two more very valuable playoff spots. We always want you to get interactive with us here on Hockey Night Online. We ask you to reach out to us at Hockey Night at David Amber at HNIC Simmer and hashtag Hockey Night. That's all on Twitter as well. Reach out to us on Facebook as we do welcome in the two time Stanley Cup champ. Of course, Craig Simpson joins us now from his uh, his office looking pretty good there with the jerseys up there in Edmonton. How you doing, Simmer? I'm doing great, David. Well, this is the fun part of the year where we can uh, start just getting to the, the business at hand. But let's start with the business last night at hand. Minnesota, a valuable two points, a one nothing win against Winnipeg. That was part of the story. But the big part of the story had to do with uh, Ilya Brizgalov. Uh, remember, he had the little brush with the Winnipeg fans last year. Well, they were taunting him badly last year. And Simmer, we saw him react to the fans in Winnipeg. Your thoughts on this? Well, I, I think it's interesting, you know, the fact that Brzezgalov has been able to reinvent himself and get himself back into the National Hockey League, uh, uh, having some success since coming over to Minnesota. I don't think he's he hasn't lost in regulation. And you know what? Uh, as long as he's not uh, making fun of the game itself, I think yeah. he he took kindly to the fact that the fans are razzing him. And he said, listen, bring it on. Uh, I, I think it's a self-inflicted wound uh, at some point because, as you said, look at him laughing about it. Uh, you know, the bottom line, David, is he's had his run-ins in the past. He's had his issues. But uh, the bottom line is he's played extremely well. And he's actually given Minnesota exactly what they needed, some stability and goal and, uh, and an opportunity going into the playoffs uh, again for him to be a goaltender who can get himself another good contract if he plays well down the stretch. Yeah, listen, he's backing it up. 24 saves, gets the shutout. If the playoffs were to start today, you have to imagine Briz Galov is the number one goalie for the Minnesota Wild. So I guess as, as long as you're winning, you do what you want <laughs> on the ice. Uh, things have not gone well, of course, for the Canadian Western teams, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary, and now Vancouver officially eliminated due to their loss last night. Uh, there is some news out of Vancouver. As the, the chants were raining down last night, fire Torts, fire Gillis. Uh, maybe there is a bit of a momentum shift to hire Trevor Linden, possibly, as the team's new president. There is some speculation that could happen. Your thoughts on that, Craig? Well, I, I think there's, you know, anytime that there's a disappointing year like the Vancouver Canucks have had, you know that there's going to be lots of speculation. Uh, I don't think it's any surprise to anyone that Trevor's name has come up. It's been a discussed about for the last oh i would say a year year and a half and and i think the reality of what you saw over the last week and a half the the banter back and forth between mike gillis and his press conference basically saying you know the Aquilinis were the one who wanted john tortorella tortorella's not my guy uh john tortorella saying we need better players i, I think there's probably a situation there that uh, will not work going forward it's been an unmitigated disaster mm -hmm. uh, i do think though that for the Aquilinis, they've got some tough decisions. It's all about money, as you know. Both guys have, uh, you know, John Tortorello's got a lot of money left on his contract yeah. another four years. I wouldn't be shocked if Trevor uh, is put in that position. The question is, though, David, you know, can Trevor come in there and be an overseer with Mike Gillis still in that role? I don't see that happening, but it'll be interesting to see if that's what transpires. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be adding more contracts. Uh, there's got to be some subtraction there in some way, shape, or form. It's interesting, though, because we've seen this uh, management uh, move by all these sort of Hall of Fame-type players when the Eisermans and Neuendikes and even Patrick Waugh coach as well as some executive uh, roles for him. Uh, any explanation there uh, how these star players are being able to transition so smoothly into the executive roles? Well, I think, you know, you look at what Steve eisenman has been able to do in Tampa, give them some stability. Uh, I think guys, especially guys like Joe Sackick and, and Steve Eisenman, who have been captains of their team, they've played long into their uh, late 30s, early 40s. Uh, the last few years, I know as a player typically, you end up being thinking more like a coach and more like an executive than even as a player because you're involved in discussions with your coach. You have such a good breast of the game of what's going on and have an understanding uh, from behind the scenes what happens. So I'm not surprised that some of those guys have come in and, and handled those roles extremely well. You know, I think without question, the avalanche, the way that things have gone for them is a good example that it can exist that two ex-players with not a whole lot of experience 
but a lot of uh, dedication and what mm -hmm. they've done and success as players have, have transformed well into those roles. Yeah, so we see in the Western Conference there won't be any Canadian teams uh, making it to the postseason. Meanwhile, in the East, it's a very tight race going down to the wire. Of course, Columbus as well as Detroit holding the uh, wild card positions right now. New Jersey, a huge loss last night. Toronto and Jersey, they have to basically run the table and pray for some luck as far as the teams that are playing Detroit and Columbus. How do you see this shaking down? Is there any chance that either Washington, Toronto, or New Jersey grabs one of those wild card positions, Craig? You know, I, I think you're right. For the Devils to lose a game like that on home ice, uh, a one nothing loss to a team like Calgary, although, as you know, Calgary's been playing loose, they've been yeah. playing well, and they've got no pressure. But that's a game that if you look at those standings and you say the Devils were, to me, the one team with the schedule that they had and beatable teams, I thought that they might be the team that does squeak in. But, you know, you lose something like that, it, it can derail your momentum. I think right now, two great stories, though. The way that Detroit's played with all the injuries, yeah. they look to me to be a destiny-type destiny team. Uh, I, I really think that they're going to grab a hold of that first wild-card spot. And a great story in Columbus. Uh, I think very similar to that, that that team believes in themselves, and that team suddenly feels like they are a playoff team, and you got to give them credit. They've won some big games uh, under a lot of pressure down the stretch. So I think it's going to be impossible for any of those, New Jersey, Toronto, or Washington, to catch those two. And you got to feel good for Columbus. They've only made the, made the postseason once before. They were swept back in 2009. You have to imagine they'll get their first ever franchise playoff win uh, maybe as soon as in the next week or so. All right, Craig, let's get to our viewer questions. Again, this is an interactive show, Hockey Night Online. This one comes courtesy of Meg Leach. Is there any chance of the realignment going back to what it was before? Clearly unfair for Eastern Conference teams, no? And I think that's in reference to 16 teams in the East, 14 teams in the West. Craig? Yeah, you know what? It, it, it has been uh, difficult for the East when, you, when you've got – you know, two more teams to try to beat out to make the playoffs. Uh, uh, I know that going in, it was not something that the general managers were all that pleased about, but there's reality from a geographical standpoint, uh, you know, in the realignment to try to make it work. Uh, I think the, the NHL was hedging their bets in, in some regard as to, you know, what would happen? Would there be some uh, change in, in where teams were going to be? Uh, I think the... The reality is, though, for now, it's going to stay. I don't think that the playoff alignment, as you know, they've decided that they're going to keep that for three years and see how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think for the East, it's a, it's a tough call. If I'm a general manager and I look down the list there and I've got two more teams I, that are nipping at my heels, it's a tough pill to swallow. But, you know, back in the days when we played, too, there was that... Uh, you know, a 21 team league. There was yeah. always one team, one uh, <laughs> division that had one more team in it. So it's not like it's unprecedented, but I think it's been a difficult pill for the Eastern teams to swallow. Yeah. Although one thing I'll say is the excitement's been there and it's probably going to go down to Sunday night, Dallas and Phoenix for that last Western conference wildcard. So at least it's worked out from a scheduling standpoint, as far as the drama leading right into the final week. Uh, another question rolls your way. This one courtesy of Chris. Quite simply, Craig, will the Leafs retool in the offseason? Hmm, that seems like an easy one for you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's no question that they need some help. And I, I think you just look at the the last game on Saturday was really a microcosm of their year. Uh, I, I think at the most critical time, they showed that they weren't a, at a stage where they were able to elevate their game. They weren't able to play a defensive game to stay in and win a game when you needed it the most. And I think that's been really their downfall. The structure of their game hasn't been there all year. The lapses that they've had, the turnovers that they had, the defensive zone coverage breakdowns have been really disappointing. So I think for Dave Notice, you know, a couple of key things. Obviously, you've got to make a decision on Carlisle, whether he uh, had lost the players and that they weren't able to, to develop the way that they needed to. They've got Dave Boland to make a decision there. but. David, do you know that there's always a, a, an opportunity to bring some players to Toronto? They always seem to be in the free agent game, so I would expect some changes there. I think the key one, though, I don't think Dave Boland's going to end up being a Leaf. And, uh, and I think that the problem with that is uh, if the Leafs are going to keep him, they're going to have to overpay him. Uh, yeah. I think it's a dangerous situation for that. 
And that, that's a big hole that they need to fill is that third line center and, and get somebody like a Bolin who can play in that role. And they're already locked into quite a number of long-term contracts at fairly big price tags. Hard to believe, but if the Leafs missed the playoffs this year, Craig, it's been 10 years and four coaches since Toronto's made the playoffs in a full 82-game season. Wow, that is a long time. Another Leaf question rolling your way, Simmer. Who's going to take responsibility for the Leafs' breakdown this season, courtesy of Tyler? Well, I, I, as I mentioned before, I think this is one that it, it probably will cost uh, Randy Carlisle his job. I think for Dave Nonis, you have to look down and say, like you mentioned, David, it's not a shortened season. It's an 82-game year. And to me, that this team hasn't been able to grasp the concepts that he's been trying to preach. And I, I think that, you know, Randy wants to be a much better defensive team. He wants to have some stability in there. But it just hasn't transpired. And at some point, you look as a general manager and say, OK, you can't get rid of all the players. What's mm -hmm. been the systematic problem? And to me, the team hasn't responded to them. So uh, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, Tim Laiwiki will have a tough decision. Do you go and you just completely uh, get the broom out and clean house? I don't think that's going to happen for Nonis. He just signed a long-term deal. I think he'll stay. But I don't think there's any question that there'll be a change in the coaching uh, behind the bench next year. All right, that segues perfectly into our next question. Again, a Leaf question. Leaf Nation really venting over the last few days as the season's come completely unglued. This one courtesy from Fishon44, who wants to know, will the Leafs trade number three or Carlisle be fired? Leafs dismantled is the hashtag. And, all right, you've already addressed the Carlisle situation. What about number three being traded? I think he has an, a no trade or at least a partial no trade clause. But do you think there's any chance of Fanuf finding his way to a new team this offseason? I, I think that's probably highly unlikely. I, and not, not that there wouldn't be an opportunity if Dave Nonis could, could retool his team and change the dynamics. Uh, I think he'd be in a desirable position to do so. But... With the contract that Dion has, with the kind of year that he's had, he's a tough call because, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's elements of his game that are obviously workable and that he can be a productive player. I, I personally think that the job of being the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs is a little bit been, uh, maybe too hard on him. I don't necessarily think he's the right personality or right mix in that role. And that, to me, when the team falters the way that the Leafs have in the last two years or three years for that matter uh, you know the pressure's certainly on I, I think that if if uh, Nonis was able to make a deal and change the makeup of his teams he would do it I don't see that happening with Dion and his contract uh, I think there are some teams that might be able to look at Dion Phaneuf and say yeah I'd like to give him a new chance and give him a new opportunity but with the contract and deal and the cap hit that he has I don't see that happening it is going to be very interesting to see what this offseason holds for the uh, seven Canadian teams. Maybe just the Montreal Canadiens kind of chilling out. Everyone else wants to retool pretty much everything. Uh, let's go to the Western Conference standings, and you'll see how tight that is. Again, it's probably going to come down to Dallas and Phoenix on Sunday night to determine that final wild card spot. The Wild, of course, can, uh, the wild, uh, can clinch a playoff spot with a point tonight as well. Let's get to a question here. It has to do with the Canucks. They're going to miss the playoffs for the first time since 2008. How can they bounce back next year? Craig? Boy, that's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> I, I think that nobody could have seen just how bad a year it's been for Vancouver. And, you know, I really felt that John Tortorella might be in a position where he could keep that team at the level that they had to be. I, I thought for a lot of times, John's the type of coach that as we saw early on, can respond to his star players, plays the heck out of them, and I thought they'd respond with great years. Instead, you look at the Sedins have both have had terrible years by their standards. The top guys have not been able to stay healthy. Uh, they maybe have been overworked early on, and that might have been part of it. The question is, do, is there really a deal, as we all heard at the trade deadline for Ryan Kessler, mm -hmm. that inevitably is going to happen? And so I really do think that they're in a situation now that the decision has to be at the end of the year, is John Tortorella the coach that can be workable? And uh, if that decision is made right early on that he's not going to be back, I think the retooling can begin, the healing can begin. If he's going to be around and the change is going to be in Mike Gillis, I look at the deals that have been done. You look at the goaltending situation that, uh, to me, they didn't get nearly the value that they needed out of that. And I don't think there's an easy fix in Vancouver. And the scary thing is 
the fans there have shown great apathy this year that they're not interested that they're disgusted as we saw at the end of the game last night yeah. and i think it's going to be a dark time right now for the next couple of years in vancouver craig shocking to think the canucks actually won the president's trophy just two years ago they've gone from tops of the nhl to you know one of the basement teams this year unbelievable uh simmer thanks so much for your time here hockey night online hope you had fun buddy all right thanks david take care have a great week yeah, I will see you, of course, uh, for Hockey Night in Canada Saturday, the Senators and the Leafs. So much more rolling your way each and every day right here, Hockey Night Online. All you got to do is get on your computer and check us out as well online at Hockey Night at David Amber at HNIC Simmer, hashtag Hockey Night. Check us out on Facebook as well. It's always great to get interactive right here on Hockey Night Online. We will see you tomorrow.